It is Victoria Day weekend, the unofficial kickoff or the official kickoff to garden season pretty much across the nation. Of course, it all depends when Jack Frost is in the forecast, but right now in Southern Ontario, looking pretty frost free as we head into this upcoming week. Uh, good morning to you all. Let's just make sure that this is working. Yeah, I got the red light that's on there. It was turned the wrong way. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more today, a little bit about what's possibly going to bug you in the garden. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the issues that you may be facing. Uh, thanks for last week. I'm sorry that I wasn't here last week. Just had a little bit of some family things that we had to deal with. So uh, we are here this week, of course, and I'm here most weeks to answer any and all your gardening questions. Just a reminder that you always have the ability to put your questions in the comments if it's on Facebook and LinkedIn and or Twitter. With that, anybody in the garden community that knows any of the answers to those questions, please chime in. I'll try to get as to many as questions as possible during this period of time to help you get growing in your garden as well. If you want to know who I am, my nickname's Frankie Flowers. I'm a four-time best-selling garden author. Uh, I have a lifetime of experience when it comes to the garden and working in garden centers. My family have two garden centers, one in Bradford, one in Barrie, called Bradford Greenhouse's Garden Gallery. As a matter of fact, you can meet me next Saturday, next Saturday, May the 27th, uh, from 12 to 2. I will be at Barry, uh, the location, which is Bradford Greenhouse's Garden Gallery in Barry. So let's get growing. Let's get going. Uh, here we go, too. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to my good friend, Tanya. Uh, good morning. Have a fabulous morning. Take off for the California to pick the 2025 introductions. Uh, so Tanya right now is in the industry. She's uh, one of the uh, works for one of the seed companies and or breeders. Uh, so it's called Ball uh, is the name. Ball Floor Plant is one of the people she works with. They just gave me two sample boxes of some new varieties that I will be testing from Pan American Seeds and Ball Floor Plant. So some fun stuff that's out there as well. We have another shout out and good morning this morning uh, from Heather Fellows. Good morning to you. We got Miriam saying good morning this morning. Uh, and then we're going to go right into, and I, I love this question. So how can I control slugs from devouring my hostas? So what's bugging you in the garden? Of course, if you have hostas, slugs tend to be an issue. First and foremost, no matter when you're ever doing anything in your garden, if you're using a product that you purchase, make sure that it's Health Canada approved. Some products that you can buy online, if they're sourced from other countries outside of Canada and sometimes even other provinces, they may not meet the restrictions that you have in your province. And the most important is they need to be Health Canada approved. There are hard home remedies that are out there. So make sure if you're using a home remedy that you test it first before you really kind of go and apply it all over. Some things work and some things don't work. Uh, let's talk a little bit about slugs then. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you, I'm just going to share my screen here because I thought we'd get this question and we're going to go right here. So Here's the wonderful, good old slug that we have in our garden, which is pretty gross. Uh, and really with slugs, they are uh, what likes and enjoys dark, wet, and warm. So dark, wet, and warm is what they really enjoy. Um, with that, I will say to you, if the one, the main thing that you can do to reduce the amount of slug population in any garden space, whether it be your hostas and or uh, any other garden is watering in the morning because if we water our gardens in the evening, what happens is we create that warm, wet environment. So it's a warm summer night, so that's weather. But if we're watering in the evening and the garden's wet, it's the ideal conditions for slugs to breed and also to live and to thrive. So making sure that your gardens, number one, are watered in the morning so they're drier at night, super key. Number two, what you can do, there are slug baits that are available that you can put down those slug baits are what the slugs will eat, consume. They're safe to use because they are the ones that are available, are Health Canada approved. Uh, one is like Slug Be Gone is one of the products that you could even go and find out there, but there are other slug baits. Uh, secondly, thirdly, what you can do is you could actually get a margin container or a container, even a Tupperware container, sink it to ground level, put a little bit of beer in there, and that's an attractant where slugs will go in and actually go into the beer and drown and die. I've done some tests on it. It'll work even with stale beer. So if you have some beer sitting around, that's not so good, maybe a little older, the cheap beer, the yucky beer, you can go and do that. But watering in the morning key, slug baits are key, uh, even building like a little slug pub like that. There is some copper tape that's available. Slugs won't walk across copper. So 
that sometimes can minimize them. So years ago, you used to see people put pennies around their hostas. That's when we had pennies, but that's also when pennies were made from copper. And then diatomaceous earth, putting that around the base of your plant. So crushed eggshells, you can purchase diatomaceous earth. Those are all things that could work well for you. Uh, we got a shout out this morning as well from uh, Bolton, Ontario. Good morning to you. We got a good morning this morning from St. Catharines, Ontario. Uh, we got a shout out and a good morning from beautiful British Columbia today. Any advice on deterring raccoons would be appreciated. There aren't any food sources or water sources around. So generally, raccoons are all based on food and water. So that's why you put that in the comments is really if they're in an area, they're in that area because there is some sort of food and or water source. Do you have grubs? Uh, the other part too is with um, raccoons, they're actually very habitual. So if they'll actually walk on your property the same way, they'll walk through your property the same way, and they're really sometimes using your property as an access point to another point to get food and or water. So either trying to figure out putting barriers in so you can break those access points are really key. If it's going and consuming or eating anything, there's a product called Animal Be Gone, which is a deterrent that you can use. Um, but really discouraging the raccoon from coming in to your property. If you can see how it's coming in, um, putting some fencing up sometimes is all you need to do just for a few days, even just to deter it. Thing about raccoons are, you know, if we could put in, you can put coyote urine down uh, in some of the areas where they're coming through because they can sense and smell the coyote. So sometimes that'll push them away. But often they're so gutsy, they're so domesticated that there's really nothing else to repel and or deter them. Uh, the other final thing is, is trapping. So you get a wildlife control company to come in and to trap and remove them and move them far away. Because once again, they'll still go into that same trail, that same walk. So just breaking their habit is one of the biggest keys that you can do. Uh, we got a good morning from uh, beautiful Brantford this morning. The sun is up and shining bright. Once again, if you are going to the garden center today, I guarantee you they will be busy. Key is before you plant any of your annuals and or perennials or trees or shrubs, please water them first, then plant them and then water them again. Uh, sometimes at some of the garden centers, they're not the best at watering, so they could already be dry. But a planting is a stress, so we want to water them. That actually makes the roots nice and relaxed and uh, a little less stress. Plant them and then water them again, and they'll do really great. You can also use a quick start fertilizer as well, which would actually help you as well. Uh, we got a question this morning. What are good plants for shady areas beside hostas? I have those. So if you want a pop of color, there are impatience, like the beacon impatience, which are downy mildew resistant, a beautiful impatient. Uh, so there's those impatience. If you want a ground cover, uh, you can use anything like Vinca Minor. Once again, though, Periwinkle, which is Vinca Minor, uh, you have to put a nice tight edge because uh, that is a ground cover, which will spread and fill areas. But at the same time, can also then become somewhat of an invasive plant, which is uh, key. A still bee, another nice plant that you can intersperse with some of the hostas. Uh, ostrich ferns in behind the hostas for a little bit of height, quite nice. Solomon seal in behind the hostas are nice. Uh, begonias, you can use uh, some of the fibrous and or wax begonias in the front. Those are all some good options too. Mm. Here we go. Um and we got another one. Morning, Frankie. How do I stop bunnies from eating my creeping thyme? And is there uh, poop okay for the garden or do I need to keep, scoop it all out? Thank you and have a great day. So first with poop, the rabbit poo, a rabbit poo is actually really good. It's actually um, a fair, I did some research on it because I had a bunch in my backyard last uh, two seasons ago. Um, and I did some research and it's actually a fairly nutrient rich uh, manure. And it's actually fairly odorless. So uh, bunny poo is indeed good for the garden. How do you keep them out of your garden from eating your creeping thyme? Once again, you can put some repellents down. So an animal will be gone. There's other repellents that you can spray on the creeping thyme. So that way they will go and eat something else because it'll actually make it taste sour. Uh, well, it's bitrix that it has within it. So it makes it taste bad. The other thing that you can do is you can place up a plastic owl. The plastic owl is a predator to rabbits. So the rabbits will see that and then will move or go somewhere elsewhere. You have to move the plastic owl around. So that's kind of key because uh, if it stays in the same place, they'll just get used to it and say that owl is kind of lazy, uh, which I always laugh about. You can do, there is, you can purchase coyote urine. You can actually put droplets of that in. If you have a dog, sometimes dog hair in the area, so anything that they don't like to see, sound, touch, taste. Those are some things that you can do. 
Uh, we have another comment this morning. Great suggestions about shady area plants, but I didn't get the name. I didn't get all the names. Can someone, uh, you know, I think ostrich. So there was ostrich ferns. So here's some great things for shady areas. Get your pen out. Ostrich ferns will give you some beautiful height in the back. And there's many different ferns that are there. There's an array of hostas. There's blue leaf hostas. There's green leaf hostas. There's hostas with big leaves, like one variety called Big Daddy. There's hostas with smaller leaves. A stilby. A stilby is a, a nice shade plant that will bloom. A stilby sprite is the one variety. A stilby sprite, really good variety <coughs> of, uh, of uh, a stilby for shade. Uh, Solomon seal, another taller grower that would do well for you. Uh, the other ones uh, for ground cover could be periwinkle or even ajuga and or bugleweed is really good. And then if you want an annual, that's going to give you a beautiful pop of color. And last there for color is the beacon impatience. Beacon impatience because they're downy mildew resistant. And I'm getting people saying begonias work for shade too. There are several varieties of begonias that are out there. So make sure when you're selecting begonias, you can use Rieger, Tuber's begonias, or a wax or fibrous begonias. Those are all good varieties for shade. The dragon wings begonia will do decently in shade, but it will do better in sun. There's actually whopper begonias. Whopper begonias will do decently in shade, but the whopper begonia and full sun, amazing. So just be really careful and key on some of them. I love that people are replying today that are giving some different, uh, um, and it's a still be, it's not still be Sprite, it's a still be. So it's A-S-T-I-B-L-E. So thanks for helping guys and well as well out there. So I want to talk to you. Uh, good morning, Frankie from Burlington. Let me answer this and then I'll go to the next one. Looking for a low flowering perennial to place in my garden bed. The garden is west facing, full sun. I have Shasta daisies and small ornamental trees in the current garden. So if you're looking for something that's low and flowering perennial, so there's a there's a bunch that are out there. One, if it's drought tolerant, <coughs> got a little titch of a cold coming on. So hmm. low drought tolerant ground cover are the stone crops. So it's the, the sedum stone crops, perennial, great, they come back. Nepia, uh, which is actually a variety of cat mint. It's a perennial cat mint that blooms blue, beautiful, works great as a low ground cover, in sun will do well. After it flowers, you cut it back and it works fantastic for you. Candy tough, which is actually a white blooming, uh, lower growing perennial plant that does really well. There's dianthus pinks, Dianthus pinks, which is a beautiful ground cover, um, uh, which blooms for a fairly long duration in pink color uh, for full sun. So those are a few selections for that as well. So I'm just going to go and hide that message really quickly. And I want to show some other things that are I want to talk about too. So uh, one thing that I'm getting a lot of questions and or comments about is Japanese beetles. So Japanese beetles in yards and gardens, a lot of people had issues with these uh, last season. Generally, the Japanese beetles sometimes refer to as the June bug. You usually see them later in June and into July as the adult stage of a grub. That's what they appear to look like. So you can see they almost have a coppery back with a green head. They can be quite identif uh, you know, they're, they're very kind of aggressive. So there's the larvae stage. So right now, if you have raccoons, skunks, anything that's digging in your ground or your garden and or your lawn, most likely they're in search of grubs. So that white larvae that's there. That white larvae is a great protein source for all those different things that would be digging up, even moles if you see mole tunnels. So we can treat for grubs now uh, and they want to be, your lawn needs to be wet and then this needs to be watered in. Uh, it's, you can use Grub Be Gone or nematodes. They're uh, Health Canada approved and they're approved with a cosmetic pesticide ban as well. They'll infect the grubs and kill the grubs out and help minimize the amount of beetles that you have. Later on in the season, when you have beetles, there are beetle traps that are available. Those are a pheromone trap that will trap them. Careful though, because they'll actually attract more beetles for the entire area over to there. So we never want to put them in the area where we're trying to get rid of them. We want to put them to an opposing area. They'll trap. The other thing that you can use is a new product, fairly new in the last few years, is called Beetle Be Gone. So those are some things that we can use to control 
uh, beetles. So just another reminder, you want to make sure the products are Health Canada approved. You want to make sure they fit within your cosmetic pesticide ban. So there's some federal uh, approved items. And then some of the different provinces also have some different restrictions when it comes to applying uh, some of the different things and treatments to your property. Uh, many of these are all uh, been developed and also kept in mind the health of you while you're applying them while at the same time protecting and keeping them maintaining the health of our plants. A uh, reminder, our plants are like an international uh, collection of people from around the world. Your garden is fairly multicultural. In that garden, there's, let's say in the spring, you had tulips that were there. Well, they could have been from the Netherlands. In the summer, you may have some verbena, which is an annual there. That could be a cutting that came from Guatemala or Costa Rica. You could have some geraniums. Those geraniums, the cutting could have came from Africa. So when we do have all these international collections, they're all CFI, CFIA, which is Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Generally, they're inspected if you're going to really good growers, and you're buying from trusted sources. Uh, but then sometimes we need some of these different, uh, what I call the pharmacy, to actually help us out in the garden that's out there. Uh, what's, what's with Cash? I was up at Cashy Lake. Shout out to Cashy. Oh, oh, Cashy Lake. Gaia. Yeah, Cashy Lake was a beautiful, beautiful place. We were up there with Breakfast Television uh, on Friday just to kick off this weekend as well. Good morning, Frankie, from sunny Bowmanville. Are there going to be more frost warnings in the next week? So you know what? I'm just going to do a little, little quick thing here, and I'm going to pull up Environment Canada's uh, weather. I'm just going to type this in first. Uh, weather, there it is. Of course, it's one of my saved pages. Imagine that. And we're going to go right here. So... What we're going to do is I'm going to share the screen with people that are out there. So we're going to share the screen and we're going to go to, boom, share the screen. So you can see that the overnight lows right now in Toronto are all hovering around that 10 degree mark. And you can see next week, some of that Western heat is what we're going to get. We're right now sitting uh, as a date of May the 21st. So generally we are after the last frost date. I always like people to just always continue to check the forecast because even in Toronto, I have seen frost warnings into early June. But as you can see, as we're heading into that last week of May, no frost in sight, but it depends on where people are watching me from. So if we were to uh, look at uh, weather, we see Barry. We can see that uh, weather in Barry. There's the weather network. I usually tend to like to look at so. We can see that the overnight lows in Barrie, the coldest low that we're getting is six degrees, which is good. So that's frost rate. So when does frost happen? Let's just tell you when frost happens. Frost happens when we have temperatures near that freezing mark. We have clear skies and light winds because frost actually needs to settle. If we have overcast skies with a little bit of a wind, even on a cold night, you may not see frost settle because it can't settle. It doesn't have the, the lack of wind that's there. If we have cold temperatures and we actually have heavy cloud cover and we even have heavy um, moisture in the, the air, so we almost have like drizzle, and it, even with the temperatures near freezing, you won't get frost. So once again, you need temperatures near that freezing mark. So anywhere around three, even four, three, two, one. Once again, when the sun rises, the temperature will fall by a couple degrees as well. Those are when we have frost warnings. So right now it looks like we're going to be frost free, which is really, really, really good. So we got Leslie, Leslie here. Let's give a shout out to Leslie. Uh, good morning, Frankie from Burlington. Oh, look, that's what I had one here. There we go. Sorry about that. We already answered that question. This is Leslie Carr. My black eyed Susan vines are turning red then dying. So black eyed Susan are an annual vine. The red uh, coloration of the leaf is a sign of stress. If they're in a container, it could be that they could be drying out. So it could be a lack of water or too much water that's there. Um, it'd be great to see a picture of where you have them planted. The Black Eyed Susan vine would need to be in full sun, does best in full sun. Uh, it is one that does not like cold winds. So it actually is more of a warm plant. Uh, hopefully you didn't have it out last week because if you did have it out last week, some of the, the reddish color, which is almost a blackish to red color, could be frost damage that you could see that's there as well. So just a little bit of that, what's going on for you there. 
Now, here we go. Why, why are my garlic leaves turning yellow? So we have been fairly dry. So some of the yellow coloration of the garlic could be that we, they're just dry. If you didn't water, so there can be some of the dry. Garlic, once again, should have been planted last fall, or I'm assuming you planted last fall and it's growing this season. Sometimes in the earlier spring, you'll get a yellowish tinge, especially if you go through a drier period. Then they'll go back to green. Depends on, love to see a picture as well to kind of determine whether, is it an issue with nutrient? Is it an issue with moisture? So yellow is, of course, a sign of stress. Uh, generally, we, we're waiting for is later season when they're into late uh, July. We're looking for the yellowing because that'll actually show the maturity of the bulb underneath. So the bulb's actually built enough energy uh, size. So that way the foliage then yellows out and that's a good time to indicate harvest, but it's not harvest at this period, but it is a sign of stress. So we got to figure out why it's causing stress. Uh, always, if you want to send me pictures, Frankie at FrankieFlowers.com. Frankie with an IE at FrankieFlowers.com is my email address. We got another question that's here. Uh, good morning, Frankie. Uh, missed uh, last weekend. Hope everything, everyone had a good Mother's Day as well. I hope everybody had a great, great uh, Mother's Day as well. Uh, what's a flowering bulb? What flowering bush is good for shade, Nancy? Stephandria. So if you look at, there's a, a variety of uh, flowering shrub, fairly low to the ground. Uh, it's a good one for shade. Uh, there are, if you're looking for something that's a little bit larger, Cornuscuso, which is the flowering dogwood. You saw probably a post on my Instagram about that. Uh, some of those will do good. Depends on the amount of shade that you're getting, how deep the shade is that you're getting. Uh, rhododendrons will flower in shade. Azaleas, Northern Lights Azaleas, uh, is a nice hardy variety of azalea that's a spring blooming that will flower in shade as well. So those are some shade guys for you. Uh, we got another reply here. See, I love that the community is replying. There better be, I'm not, I'm, I'm in Newcastle, it was bad last week, talking about the frost and the frost warnings. It got cold, last week got really cold as a surprise. Um, here we go. How can I shade my two-year-old hydrangeas that were supposed to be sunshade, but not so? I thought about planting a small tree nearby to give them any shade. Any ideas? So uh, first off with those hydrangeas, uh, Hydrangeas need a lot of water. So even when a hydrangea is more in a sunny location, if it's provided with enough, enough moisture, water, it should do well, it should do very well. Um, if you want to provide shade for it, you can do some planting around it. And that's sometimes the best to create shade or <laughs> you hear me, the right plant for the right place move those hydrangeas to an area that maybe is a little bit more um, ideal for them and then plant a variety of hydrangea that will do well in that sunny space. Uh, varieties of hydrangeas that do well in sun are limelights. There's the little limelights, which is actually a dwarf variety, the regular limelights, they do fantastic. Incredible hydrangeas also do very well in full sun as well. So those are some of the different suggestions that I have for you, but a good question as well. Um, <clears throat> Here we go. In an effort to ward off rabbits and other nibbling creatures, I wrap the base of my freshly planted white feather hosses with some tinfoil and so far it's worked. So that's just a distraction. So that's actually making it um, difficult for them, number one, to go into chew, but also you're finding with tinfoil and you see people where they actually, if to, even to keep sometimes birds off fruit trees, like cherry trees, you actually see pie plates, the aluminum pie plates, hung in trees. And if you're like wondering what the heck are people doing that because they blow and they create a little bit of noise, but at the same time, the reflection scares birds away. So that tinfoil can be scaring as well. The only thing is, is when things get really hot, that tinfoil can then reflect light off it. And you know, hostas are generally in shade, but that reflection of light can also cause some issues as well. So just be careful with the use of tinfoil, but there's a good Good little indication for you as well. I know some people that even take plastic forks and stick them upside down into the spaces so that when the rabbit comes up, the plastic fork kind of gives them a little and they're like, they're out of there because it just kind of discourages them. So there's many different things that we can do. Uh, we got another comment and or question. Uh, Brandy, hello from Kitchener. I have a rhododendron, rhododendron broadleaf evergreen that has not bloomed in two years. So I was going to transplant it. Where's the best place for it? I have full sun part, uh, I have full sun, part sun, 
and shady places. So it's going to want part sun to shade uh, is the best for a rhododendron. Rhododendrons like acidic soil. So sometimes a little pine needles around the base of that or even putting some aluminum sulfate to acidify the soil will help. Rhododendrons actually take a full year to develop their flower buds. So in terms of their flower buds, they form during this growing season. They sit there dormant and then flower in the spring. So if you're doing late season pruning and or spring pruning, you're removing the flower buds that are there. Rhododendrons will also benefit from uh, a treatment in the fall of an anti-desiccant, something like wilt proof. That'll actually reduce the amount of moisture loss so you won't get browning on the leaf because it is a broadleaf evergreen. Um, and then rhododendrons in the winter really would not like a northwest wind pushing against them. So either plant them in an area that's shaded from wind or protected from wind, or just do a burlap screen around it, leave the top open so the snow can fall on the top, but the burlap screen will shade to keep the wind uh, away from the uh, rhododendrons, but at the same time, will minimize the amount of sunlight that they have on them as well. Uh, we got another comment or question here. Frankie, my begonias got a touch of frost the other day. Will they come back or are they done? Depends on how much any of the dead looking stems and or branches, remove all of that, give them a good watering. You can give them some quick start fertilizer or just a regular all purpose fertilizer, like a miracle grow to see if they'll push back. If they have over 50% frost damage, they're probably done. Uh, so frost is really hard on plants and begonias, begonias are 90% water. So what happens with that, not only is the frost, but when the frost gets on that plant, it actually freezes the water inside the cells of your begonia. So when that water freezes, water expands, and then that breaks the cell wall. By breaking the cell wall, there's no coming back from that. Um, we have another comment, and this is from Francis. Hi, Frankie. A uh, really big pot of perennial. Can I put them in pots are really big? I live in Newfoundland. I have really big pots. What perennial can I put in them that, uh, that are in Newfoundland? So once again, hi, Frank. I have really big pots. What perennial can I put in them? The pots are really big. I live in Newfoundland. So once we put perennials into a container, if we're thinking about overwintering them in a container, that perennial plant is gonna be one to two zones colder than what it would be in the ground. Because it's in a pot up and exposed, that pot will freeze more solid than the ground. So it's about finding your hardiness zone in that area of Newfoundland where you are, which I would assume be a zone four, but some areas are zone three. And then what we're looking for is we're looking for plants that are, are hardier than zone four. So if you're in a zone four, zone three, zone two, sedums tend to do well, which is some of the autumn joy variety of sedums will come back. Some hosta varieties, I've seen them come back even if they're really cold but look at for perennial varieties that are hardy to a zone two, at least a hardy to a zone two is what I would really recommend. Um, here's another question that we have. Heather Mel. Oh, hello, beautiful lady. I love it that people are saying good morning to each other here as well. And they're saying, Jessica's saying good morning to me as well. Good morning from Baxter, Frankie flowers, Heather, uh, out there. I'm being attacked by Manitoba maple saplings. Is it best to dig them out or can I just cut them down? Uh, the digging them out is probably the, the best thing to do, but even by cutting them down, you're restricting that foliage. If you're restricting the foliage, then you're going to starve the root. So it will eventually kill them out. Um, but if you can dig them out and then if you give up, if there's that many and you're like, I'm just give up, you're better off just to cut them to restrict top foliage. Because if you're like, okay, well, I'll get to them, I'll get to them, I'll get to them. And you don't, then that's when they're going to take over time for you. Um, we got, uh, we got, I love some of the comments that are out there too, how people are going and replying it depends on how bad they got it. So that's the whole idea guys, that this is a, a community that you can see that I'm not going to get to all the questions because there's just so many questions, but people on here are going to, um, answer some of the comments and comment on some of the questions. So when you go through the comments, you'll learn because we'll all learn as a group together and gardening is a journey. We're all going to learn. We're all going to have success going to have failure. I have lots of failure, lots of failure. Let me tell you. Good morning, Frank. Can I put my cactus outside? Yes, you can put your cactus or if they're plural, cacti outside. First I would do is put them in a part sun and then gradually introduce them to full sun. Because if we were to put them from indoors right to full sun, sometimes even cactus can get sun scorch, which is like a sunburn. So we put them outdoors kind of in something that's even in morning sun. And then you incorporate and move them more to full sun. 
they will do great outdoors. They will do great. And then you're bringing them back in in the fall when, uh, before frost warnings start to come. Um, here's another question. Any suggestions for hydrangeas? I have a hydrangea vine that hasn't flowered in forever. So hydrangea vines, I, they're, they're aggressive growers. Uh, sometimes what happens is they put a lot of foliage on because they will also um, get a lot of nitrogen. So they'll put a lot of growth on. Uh, a reminder, hydrangea also is one that takes a full season to develop its bloom. So if you're doing any pruning and you're doing that pruning uh, late summer or summer to fall, you're removing and restricting flowers. So maybe what I would suggest you to do now this spring, because you're, if you're thinking you don't see any flower buds that are there, is I would maybe even give it a pruning of about half its size right now. Prune it back to half its size. Let it grow through through this season. Don't touch it next spring. Only remove next spring any dead wood that you see on it, so any dead stems. So once it starts to flush out and you see all the growth that's there, just remove any dead stems and see if that'll help out. Also applying during the growing season, a fertilizer that's not as nitrogen rich. So let's say that's near the lawn and maybe he's getting some lawn fertilizer. Applying a fertilizer that has more of a higher middle number, phosphorus, to actually help for some of that bloom and or bud development. Those are really important things that are going to help you out as well. Great question. So we're at 31 minutes, guys. I'm just going to give one more uh, little question. Let's see what we have here. I'm just going to pick a quick one. Uh, oh, we'll just, we'll just give a little shout out to Ashley and this is how we'll end. Good morning from Niagara Wine Country. I can't believe how far ahead their lilacs are compared to Aurelia. So Niagara compared to Aurelia is sometimes 10 days to two weeks further ahead. The reason being, uh, number one is it's just that much further south. So it actually gets more daylight. So the further north you're going, the less daylight, even by just five minutes, makes a huge difference. So even if the Niagara region is getting five minutes each day more daylight than what it is in Aurelia, you'll get your bloom period that much earlier. Um, you're also seeing the temperature be moderated there by Lake Ontario. So Lake Ontario will keep Niagara on the lake a little bit cooler, but on those colder nights where we have frost, will actually help insulate that area. That's why there's wine growing down in that, in that area. So that's the reason why they're that much further ahead. And Niagara, I was just there, guys. I was in wine country. I was at uh, Prince of Wales Hotel with Vintages on um i was there on monday if you get a chance pillar and post niagara check out pillar and post it's open to the public you don't need to stay there right across the street from them is a beautiful garden that's inspired by monet you're going to see something on my instagram coming up and on the facebook a little bit of a tour as well so i'm going to end it right there guys i got lots of gardening to do today lots of fun to do today i'm going to spend some time with the kids i hope everybody out there today is having a good time a reminder as well Health Canada approved, make sure that you're getting products that are Health Canada approved. Identify the insect before you actually go treat so we can actually make sure we're treating for the right things. And before you garden, always go out and do a little stretching. We forget that gardening is a physical leisure outdoor activity. Put on some sunscreen uh, as well. Make sure you keep yourself hydrated. Stay safe. Happy gardening. Happy Victoria Day weekend all. Over and out. Have a blooming.